Hello, and welcome to your introductory cardiac anatomy lab. In this lab, we're going to be going through two different cardiac models. The one you can see here is the Denoyer Geppert All American Heart. And the second one we're going to look at is the Alte Scientific uh, four part dissectable heart. And that heart is much larger. Okay, first of all, let's start out with some major anatomy. We have the apex, which is the pointy part of the heart down there. Now, the apex usually doesn't point down. It actually points to the left-hand side. So the heart is normally kind of laying on its side. So we're not actually in standard anatomical position right now. Okay, the next part of the heart we have is something called the base. And this is something that has confused students years and years in and out. So the base of the heart is not the inferior part of the heart. It's actually the superior part of the heart. And this is where all the blood vessels come out of the heart, uh, such as the aorta, the pulmonary arteries, etc. So the base is actually at the top of the heart. Okay, next off we have the oracles. Now, oracle here means ear. So the oracles are on the left and right hand side of the heart, and they are pouches, out pouchings from the atria, which are the top two chambers. So on the outside, we can see the right and left oracles, and then we can see below that uh, where the right and left ventricles might be. And you might be asking yourself, saying, hey, does Langston not know his left from his right? But here we're talking about the heart's left and right. Imagine this is your heart, and this would be your heart's right side, your heart's left side. So that's why we're talking about right and left. Okay, other things we need to talk about. The major vessels coming out of the heart right here, we can see three of them. The superior vena cava, which is a vein. The aorta, which is a large artery. And also the pulmonary trunk, also a large artery. Now, we're going to go through each of these vessels in some detail. So first off, let's take a look at the vena cava. So the vena cava drains blood uh, from the top part of the body and brings it back to the right atrium. And so two vessels will combine to create the vena cava, and these are the right and left brachiocephalic veins. And brachio here means arm, and cephalic means head, so brachiocephalic veins. And then they all drain into the vena cava, the superior vena cava, which again drains into that right atrium. Okay, now let's take a look at the aorta. Now the aorta is the largest uh, diameter artery in the body, and it also has to withstand a lot of pressure because there's really high pressure blood in there. And it has three parts. It has an ascending part, which is arising from the left ventricle. It has a aortic arch, which is sort of the candy can shape you see right there. And finally, we also have something called the descending aorta, which is more visible on the backhand side of the heart. Okay, now let's take a look at the three branches of the aorta. Remember, the aorta is an artery, and arteries carry blood away from the heart. And so the artery here is carrying blood into three different places. On the right-hand side, you can see something called the brachiocephalic trunk. And brachio, again, means arm. Cephalic means head. So this is an artery that's going to give rise to the subclavian artery in the arm and also to the carotid artery on the right-hand side of the body. So that's where that's going. And then over here, we have two different arteries. We have a left common carotid artery. That gives rise to the left common carotid. And we also have a left subclavian artery. So the arteries here are not bilaterally symmetrical. Remember, this brachiocephalic trunk is what's going to give rise to the right uh, subclavian and right carotid, whereas the left carotid and the left subclavian arise separately on the arch of the aorta. Okay, next off we have the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery, or pulmonary trunk here, as it's better called, is coming out of the right ventricle, and so it's carrying high pressure blood, but blood that is deoxygenated, and that's why this artery is pictured in blue right now. And that branches off to make our left and right uh, pulmonary arteries. And pulmonary here means it's going to the lungs. Pulmonary arteries is taking the uh, blood to the lungs for oxygenation. Okay, pulmonary veins are a little bit difficult to see on this particular image of the heart because they're more towards the back side. But rest assured, we do have two uh, pulmonary veins on each side, and these pulmonary veins are bringing blood back to the heart uh, from the lungs. And so they're bringing oxygen-rich blood uh, back from the lungs to the left atrium. Okay, and then there's another vessel or a remnant of a vessel we need to talk about called the ligamentum arteriosum. And that sounds like something from, I don't know, Harry Potter, like Wingardium Leviosum. Uh, but here, the ligamentum arteriosum is actually a vestige of a shunt called the ductus arteriosus. And the ductus arteriosus was a fetal shunt that allowed passage of blood uh, from the pulmonary artery directly into the aorta. 
And what this did was sort of bypass much of the pulmonary circuit because think about what's going on during fetal life. There's nothing to breathe down there. And so the uh, embryo and later fetus is getting its oxygen uh, from the mother's placenta. And so we have these bypasses or shunts that uh, basically divert blood away from the lungs. And obviously these shunts have to shut down pretty close to the time of birth or after birth. Otherwise we're gonna have big problems. Okay, now let's talk about the coronary arteries. Now the coronary arteries are the arteries on the outside of the heart that supply the heart muscle with oxygen-rich blood. And you might think, well, the heart already has these huge arteries and veins in there, but that doesn't actually supply the myocardium with oxygen-rich blood for its own metabolic needs, and so that is the job of the coronary arteries. You can see we have a left coronary over here and a right coronary over there. Okay, they're very small arteries, they're very easily occluded, and that's why you've heard of people having coronary artery disease and may, maybe even having a myocardial infarction as a result of that. Okay, now let's take a look on the inside of the heart. Now this uh, great denoyer Geppert heart is great because it is dissectable. It lets us see all the different chambers in there. Okay, first off, let's talk about the atria. The atria are the internal chambers that are above the ventricles. And so the job of the atria is to pump blood uh, into the ventricles. It doesn't have to pump very far. So we can see we have a right atrium, which is visible right there, left atrium right there. The right atrium is gathering oxygen-poor blood from the vena cava, and the left atrium is gathering oxygen-rich blood uh, from the pulmonary veins. Okay, now let's take a look at the ventricles. The ventricles are much more muscular chambers because they have to pump uh, much further distances. The left ventricle is pumping through the whole body, really, and the right ventricle is pumping to the lungs. So it has to overcome all that vascular resistance that we find in the enormous capillary beds within the systemic circuit for the left ventricle and for the pulmonary circuit for the right ventricle. And that's why these are very large muscular chambers with the left chamber being much more muscular than the right. Okay, separating the atria from the ventricles, we have something called the tricuspid and bicuspid valves. These are atrioventricular valves. So they separate the atria from the ventricles and they prevent backflow of blood when the uh, ventricles are contracting and ideally pushing blood up to the pulmonary trunk and up to the aorta. So this keeps that blood from backflowing into the atria. So on the right-hand side, we have the tricuspid. Remember, tri and right both have an R in it. And on the left-hand side, we have the bicuspid or mitral valve. Now, mitral here refers to the shape of the valve, which looks kind of like uh, the Pope's hat or mitre, and that's why we sometimes call it a mitral valve. Okay, there's another valve that we can see here, and that's the pulmonary semilunar valve. The semilunar valves are in between the ventricles and the great blood vessels that leave them. So this one is in between uh, the right ventricle and the pulmonary trunk. And what it does is it prevents the backflow of blood uh, back into the ventricles once the ventricles start to relax or undergo diastole. Now let's go back to our atrioventricular valves and I want to show you some anatomy we didn't point out before. And these are things called chordae tendini. The chordae tendini or tendinous cords are these little uh, connective tissue fibers which help to connect the valves uh, to the muscle of the heart. And the areas where they connect on those muscles are called uh, papillary muscles. So they're little nipple-like muscles that attach to these chordae tendini, which literally means heart strings. So when you hear somebody saying, oh, you're pulling on my heart strings, this is what we're talking about, the chordae tendini. All right, let's take a look at the right-hand side of the heart and take a look at the anatomy we can see there. So first off, we have the right atrium opened up, and you can see a couple things in there. The first off is something called the fossa ovalis. Now remember back to the bones chapter, we said a fossa was a depression. Well, this fossa here is a depression that actually used to be a foramen. It used to be a hole. And that foramen there was actually the foramen ovale. And the foramen ovale was a shunt, again, between the left atrium and the right atrium that allows the bypass of that pulmonary circuit for the same reason we talked about before. There's no reason for fetal circulation to send so much blood to the lungs if there's nothing to breathe while that baby's in utero. So this was a bypass that is normally closed off soon after birth, and it becomes something called the fossa ovalis. Another thing you can see here that we couldn't see in a previous slide is we have the inferior vena cava. The inferior vena cava is bringing back oxygen-poor blood from the lower half of the body, so the legs and things like that. And if we take a look at the left-hand side of the heart, we can see some more anatomy as well. So first off, I want to point out the uh, left pulmonary arteries, which is up here. So that's branching off our pulmonary trunk. And remember, the pulmonary trunk is carrying oxygen-poor blood to the lungs. We also have our pulmonary veins. And you say, why are the veins red? That doesn't make sense. Well, remember the definition of a vein is it brings blood back to the heart. 
doesn't mean that that blood is not oxygenated. And in this case, the pulmonary veins are bringing oxygen-rich blood back to the heart uh, from the lungs, so pulmonary veins there. And then we also have something called the bundle of Hiss. The bundle of Hiss is part of our conductive system of the heart. You can't see a lot of the conduction system on these models, but remember we have an SA node, an AV node, uh, the bundle Hiss, uh, the left and right bundle branches, etc. So there's a lot of conductive tissue that you won't really see on a heart model. Okay, let's take a look at the backhand or posterior side of the heart to see what we can see there. Remember this area was called the base. The base is where all the blood vessels connect. And we have coming out of that, uh, first of all, the uh, descending aorta, which you can see right there. We also have our vena cava. And coming off the backside of our vena cava is something called the azygous vein. So azygous here is going to the spine. And then we also have, uh, you can see our trachea, which is down here trachea, and that branches off to our right and left bronchi. And finally, you can see back here is our esophagus. So there's a lot of tubing going on uh, very, very close to the heart. In this area, we call it the mediastinum. Okay, now we're going to take a look at the inferior side of the heart to see some anatomy we probably couldn't see before. And this right here is our inferior vena cava. Remember, that's bringing blood back from the lower extremities, the legs. Okay, the next thing we can see here is we can see an inferior view of the heart showing the coronary sinus, which is right here, and is enlargement of the uh, cardiac veins. And we can also see our small cardiac vein and our middle cardiac vein. So these veins are analogous to the coronary arteries, but instead of carrying oxygen-rich blood, they're actually draining the muscle of oxygen-depleted blood and carrying that back to the lungs eventually so that oxygen can be replenished. All right, before we wrap up, I want to look at another version of the heart, and this is the uh, Alte Scientific four-part dissectable heart model. And it's a much larger heart, and if you get to work within a classroom, it's a real joy because you can see a lot of different things on there that you can't see on the smaller heart models. Okay, firstly, the anatomy of this heart should be identical to the other heart model we looked at. You can see up there we have our superior vena cava, our right auricle, we have the aorta, we have our pulmonary trunk, our left auricle, and of course the apex or point of the heart. So everything should be the same. Now, if we take a look up top, it's much larger. We can see much more detail. So let's talk about the blood vessels we see here, right? This was going to be our arch of the aorta, and coming up off top, on the right-hand side, we have our brachycephalic trunk, and that's going to give rise to our right carotid artery as well as our right subclavian. And then these other two vessels, again, are not symmetrical. They branch off here. We have our uh, common carotid for the left-hand side and also our left subclavian artery as well. Now, the backhand side, you can see our superior vena cava and coming off there, our azygous vein. And what I really love about this model is we see very, very clearly the four different uh, pulmonary veins that are bringing blood back to the left atrium after it's been oxygenated in the lungs. Okay, another thing I really like about this heart model is that it dissects in a very different way than the heart model we looked at previously. So in this model, we can actually pull off the great vessels, that is the pulmonary trunk and the aorta, and actually see the semilunar valves here. So we have an aortic semilunar valve, which prevents backflow of blood from the aorta into the left ventricle. And we also have a pulmonary semilunar valve, and this prevents backflow of blood from the uh, pulmonary trunk into the right ventricle. All right, in addition, this heart actually dissects in a frontal plane. So what we can see here is the left and right atria and also the left and right ventricles. So you can see all four chambers here, and you can also see the atrial ventricular valves, which are the tricuspid on the right and the bicuspid on the left. Remember, another name for the bicuspid is the mitral valve, and that the tricuspid has an R in it, and it's on the right side of the heart. So that's how you can keep those two apart. Another anatomical structure we can see in this heart model is something called the interventricular septum. This is a septum made up of cardiac muscle that divides the left and right ventricles. Okay, on this model we can also see the chordae tendineae and also the papillary muscles. Together these help to anchor the atrioventricular valves and prevent them from prolapsing or blowing backwards when the heart contracts. We can also see our fossa ovalis up here. Remember, our fossa ovalis is a narrow depression that earlier on during fetal life was actually our foramen ovale, which is one of those shunts that allows blood to bypass the pulmonary circuit. Okay, before we wrap up today, we're gonna go through the pattern of cardiac circulation that is showing how blood moves through the heart, and we're gonna show whether it's oxygen rich or oxygen poor. 
So first, let's start off with the vena cava. So blood enters the right atrium via the superior and inferior vena cava. And what we can see, these blue arrows indicate that this is oxygen-poor blood. So oxygen-poor blood and blood with a lot of CO2, and that's coming back from our systemic circuit. It's entering the right atrium, and then from there, it goes through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. So we're still oxygen-poor at this point. Now, when the right ventricle contracts, that's going to force the blood up through our uh, pulmonary semilunar valve up to our pulmonary trunk. And remember, the pulmonary trunk is carrying blood uh, to the pulmonary arteries, which is going to the lungs. So this is going to carry that blood to the lungs where it can be oxygenated. Now, after we're in the lungs, that blood's going to come back via the pulmonary veins. We have four pulmonary veins, and they all empty into the left atrium. And so the left atrium has got oxygen-rich blood. And that blood is then going to move through the bicuspid or mitral valve into the left ventricle. All right, and when the left ventricle contracts, that's going to force that blood uh, from the left ventricle uh, through the aortic semilunar valve and into the aorta itself. And remember, the aorta is the gateway into the systemic circuit. So this is carrying oxygen-rich blood uh, to the rest of the body to replenish the tissues with oxygen. Okay, before we wrap up, we just want to go through a little bit of cardiac muscle histology. Now, remember that cardiac muscle is involuntary. We cannot voluntarily contract it, but it is striated, just like skeletal muscle. We'll see striations in there. But unlike skeletal muscle, we don't have many nuclei. In general, we usually only have one nucleus per cell, and those cells are separated by something called intercalated discs. So intercalated discs are discs that allow for electrical communication between adjacent cells. And this is very important in the cardiac muscle because we have to have synchronized contraction in order to have systole and pump the blood efficiently.